All right, well, greetings everybody. I know it's 2.30 p.m. Central, uh, 1.30 Mountain Time, where my guest John Bevere is, and then for anybody else on the, on the face of the earth, uh, greetings wherever you are and whatever time it is. Um, I want to dive right on into the conversation today. It is an honor, John, to have you on. We have done one of these broadcasts before. You are somebody that I know is no stranger to the audience, uh, audience of you know, my ministry of Destiny Image, and uh, I want to give you as much time to share about this message as possible. But John has got this new book come out that just came out, literally just came out hot off the press. I encourage you to go to Messenger International or Amazon particularly to pick or this up. Anywhere, anywhere. anywhere they've got books and where you see this book, if you find it in the airport, where John's books have been known to have been seen, get the book. <laughs> this is a, you know, I, I do any kind of broadcast I don't care if it's a Destiny Image author or an author who has written a I'm after what God is saying right now. This is a book, a message that God is saying right now. So, John, without further ado, I'm going to do some little mechanical things here to get the broadcast out there. But I'd love you to share just for a moment a little bit about yourself and what compelled you specifically. Why now for this book? So first of all, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. All right, I have no respect for you as a man of God and for Destiny Image. Destiny Image has given us some of the greatest books uh, in the church in the 21st century and the 20th century. I'm so grateful for the founder. Uh, he is an amazing man. So I just have to say what the honor is on my end, okay? Uh, this book is really, really passionate in my heart right now because I believe prophetically, Larry, we are in a season where I believe the church at large, we're about ready to come out of the harvest or out of the desert. What is the desert? First of all, what is the wilderness? Wilderness for people in the Bible was a physical place. It may have been caves. It may have been, you know, deserts, but for us, it's a lot of time. It's up here. It's our walk. It's situations that we're going through. Um, it's when God seems like his tangible presence is a million miles away and his promises that he's made to us are even further. Yeah. If you look at Joseph, God makes him a, gives him a vision. You're going to be a leader. Your brothers are going to serve you. But we all know he goes from pit to slavery to dungeon. And every one of those incidences is him just sharing what God had showed him or him obeying the word of God. He didn't bring it on himself. God didn't make those things happen to him. God knows the end from the beginning. God didn't make his brothers sell them into slavery, but God knew their personality, what they would do. So he used what they would do in order to refine him and give him the character. If you look at him, he's a tattletale. He's a bragger when he shows up on scripture. He talks down to his brothers. But when you see him at the end, He's not talking down. He's not bragging. He's blessing his brothers. He has forgiven his brothers. So I see that there's a three-step process that God does to get us into our destiny. First of all, he makes us promises. He gives us a glimpse. David, you're going to be a leader. You're going to be a king. Um, secondly, there's the process, and that's what we have affectionately termed as the wilderness. And then when we're successful in the wilderness and obedience to God, we come into the fulfilled promise. Now, um, I personally believe, you know, Larry, I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to when we were in the 1980s, yeah. <clears throat> um, our church, I was the executive assistant to the pastor. Um, we had 450 paid staff members. We were wow. one of the best known churches in the country In our services. I remember a guy with a red and white walking cane coming in and he couldn't see, and I'm the pastor's executive assistant. Okay. But he walked out seeing. I remember the ambulance pulled up. This guy had less than 24 hours left to live. They, the paramedics wheeled him in. And this guy was so miraculously healed of cancer that he pushed his bed out in front of, in front of 4,000 people. I remember one time Jesus appeared. And when he left, he left an imprint of his face on the wall. And that imprint looked like the Shroud of Turan. It was eight feet by six feet. And it stayed on the wall for a year and a half. I'm thinking this is normal Christianity, okay? Every church is like this, and it, it was back then. But what happened was God spoke to me in that time period, and he said, son, I've given my church a thimble full of my power to see how she'll handle it. And let me tell you how we handled it. 
I picked up all the guest speakers that came to our church. And we're talking about, we had a wall of cr crutches, canes. We had a wall of walkers and wheelchairs where people had literally gotten up. And because I was the assistant to the pastor, I knew these were genuine miracles. Oh, yeah. But half of those guys that God was using aren't even in, I'm not saying half because I don't statistically know that, but a good portion of those men are not even in ministry today. Um, the pastor isn't even in ministry. The building had to be condemned because it had black mold, a 4,000 seat auditorium, state of the art, everything. They had to condemn it. And God said to me, I've given my church a thimble full to see how she'll handle it. And then I'm going to bring her into a wilderness. And in that wilderness, I'm going to prepare the church's character to handle the greatest move of the spirit of God the earth has ever seen. And I believe that we're at the very end of that time period. And the greatest attack against us comes just before our harvest. If you look at David, that's when Ziglag got camp, uh, his wives and children were taken. His own men wanted to stone him. That was just literally three days. I think it was three or four days before he became king of Hebron and then ultimately Israel. So his greatest attack to give up came just before his harvest. And I realize there's a lot of people out there. God has called them to the marketplace. He's called them to... Uh, health care. He's called them to the education. He's called them to prominent positions, ministry. And with that is also going to be a tremendous amount of power for those positions. Yeah. I believe God is getting ready to take us as a church prophetically into this time. Jesus went into the desert filled with the spirit, but he returned. He came out in the power. James says it like this, Blessed is the man that endures tests and trials. Afterwards, he'll receive the crown of life. Crown speaks of authority. So we're going to come out of this time with authority and power like Jesus did. And I believe that we're going to have a great impact. And, and the result is going to be a great harvest of souls. And what my real desire for this book is, is to see people not faint just before their harvest. It would have been really easy for David to faint. You know, when your own men, the last 400 guys that believe in, on you and the planet want to stone you. Yeah. Okay. But he, but he didn't. And he became one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. Joseph, the same way. If Joseph would have been bitter, if he would have been bitter with God and his brothers, when those butler and baker came, think of it. He hasn't seen any evidence of God moving in his life as far as his dream goes, his brothers serving him. In 12 years and that butler and baker came and said we had dreams he could have he could have said and this is what a lot of people would have done you had a dream leave me alone i had a dream once dreams don't come true god doesn't fulfill dreams he would have died in that dungeon saying god doesn't fulfill his promises and so larry it's my absolute utter desire to see everyone enter in to that position god has called them to because we need everyone in those positions now, what I want to do for a moment, because I feel, I feel the Holy Spirit really on that, particularly as you are talking about, folks, for those of you who are watching, John was addressing people in every sphere of influence. That's what I love about your ministry, John. That's where we need to get, is that whether you are in healthcare, whether you're in education, politics, government, arts, media, you carry the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Lord is saying to you right now, I have you where I have you because I want my presence in that place. He wants people who are under his influence, under the influence of Holy Spirit in those places. Because guess what? If you have influence in the place where God has put you, that means a life, a person, you, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, is having influence there, which means God is having an influence in that place. And John, what I believe that this book is doing for people, I just, I, I marked this page, and I've got to read this for folks. It says, don't be misinformed. This is page 15. The Lord does not stop working in our lives just because we are in the wilderness. And just for those who feel like I'm in the wilderness, particularly for those of you who have had prophet, uh, prophetic words of promises, and you know they were from the Lord, but you are not seeing them materialize or come to pass. I believe the Lord's saying, I've given you the wilderness as a gift. I feel the presence of the Lord on this, John. This is coming from your book. He says, I've given you the gift of a wilderness because I'm taking you through a process so that when the promise or the prophetic word comes to pass, it doesn't destroy you. Because correct me if I'm wrong, John, but wilderness is where we're cultivated. That's where character and strength, I mean, that's exactly what the subtitle, finding strength and purpose in the wilderness. Can you talk a little bit about the blessed, what is God doing in our lives when we are in a wilderness season. So, so it, 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 example, example, not go to the wilderness, and that's King Saul. 
So King Saul didn't go through a wilderness. And if you look at King Saul, he has every appearance of being extremely humble. When, when Samuel first approaches him and says, I've got a word from God for you, he's like, what? I am the least in my household, and my house is the least in the tribe, and, the, and our tribe's the le- least of all the tribes. And then when that inauguration day comes, when God shows that it is Saul that he has chosen, Saul was hiding in the equipment. He, he didn't want it. He had this, this humility. But after he won the battle with the Amalekites, he set up a monument to himself. But if you look at David, David never did that. David went through a character refining time, Joseph the same way. And so ultimately God wants to protect us because if we don't have a preparation time, the promotion could kill us. The promotion could destroy us. The promotion could steal that joy and that life of God that's in us. And, 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 and so the wilderness, it refines, it prepares us. It, it is a time where we're tested. Now, everybody has a negative concept of testing. Look, I just flew back uh, across the Pacific Ocean for ministering yesterday, all right? And I am so glad that my pilot was tested. And the reason the testing, they did the testing on the pilot wasn't because they wanted to prove to eliminate him. They wanted to make sure that when he was halfway over the Pacific, that he didn't kill himself and me. So testing just says, hey, you're finding out what's in your heart. God said, I brought you into this desert so that you could find out what's in your heart. God already knows what's in our heart. So it's a time of humbling. It is a time when genuine humility is built in us. So we're not like a Saul. We look like we're humble. But then all of a sudden, when we get that promotion, it destroys us. It's a time when God reveals himself. God revealed himself to Moses on the backside of the desert. He revealed himself to Joseph in dreams, in, in the dungeon, in interpreting dreams. He revealed himself to John the Baptist. He was in the desert, and the word of the Lord came to him. So it's a time when God reveals himself. So there are many, many benefits. And I think the thing that really trips people up, Larry, is it seems like God's not working in our life. It seems like he's put us on a shelf. It seems like he's abandoned in us. But God is the one that says redeem the time. So the wilderness time is not a waste of time. It seems like a waste of time, but it's not. Our cooperating with the wilderness can keep the wilderness from being extended. So I always tell people like this, you can't shorten it, but you sure can lengthen it. If you look at God, God had every intention in the children of Israel being in the wilderness one year. But because they didn't cooperate, because they were complaining, they ended up being there 40 years. So you can't shorten it, but you sure can lengthen it. Wow. Wow. Well, and here's what I want to do, because I want to be sensitive with your time. John. I kind of want to finish talking on this kind of this is we're, right now, folks, we're dealing on a personal level in terms of what God is doing in your life. I'll, how I want to conclude this conversation in a couple of minutes, John, is really talking about what the Lord is doing in the church right now. Because as I told you before we started this interview, there's two chapters in this book, unfortunately or fortunately. I don't know. I just can't go ahead over them. Chapter four and five that talk about relationship with the Holy Spirit, relationship yeah. with them. Yeah. And then also the new wine. And that's something I believe the Lord is speaking right now. I mean, you've got Hill Song writing a beautiful song called New Wine. This yeah. is that, that's language that used to be perhaps for a few charismatics in a, a Pentecostal type of church. But it's almost there's there's this recognition. And I say this to you individually as well. There's a recognition that God is doing something new in the earth. I just got to announce that. And here's the reality. Don't don't let that scare you, because. It's not something that will be contrary to what's revealed and written in Scripture. You know, God's not adding to the Scriptures. It's not different than Scripture. But God has the prerogative when it comes to his methods to do what he wants to do. So we're going to get there in a minute. But, you know, John, I just, I don't, this is what I feel led, directed to do. But for those of you personally who are struggling in a personal wilderness, okay, you feel like that language resonates with you. It's like, God, what are you doing right now? I believe that this book will help you navigate that. But even in this conversation, God right now is doing something. I wanted to finish reading that bit here. It says, God leads us through the wilderness. Without him, we could never make it through. Furthermore, listen to this. It is not a place in which we are put on a shelf until he desires to use us. You've got to know that. I feel like sometimes people think the wilderness is a time of inactivity where like nothing is happening. But I feel like the Lord, again, that's why I love this book. This book gives language to what's going on behind the scenes. Perfect. You are, Perfect. You know, it, 
that, that's, that's exactly what's happening, John, because you've perceived in the natural, well, nothing's happening. I got this promise and I got this prophecy and I'm not getting any closer to that. But I feel like the Lord's saying to you right now, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and there's an invitation and a call for you to yeah. partner with the activity of God that you may not even see or perceive but sometimes just on the basis of teaching and on the basis of the word of God, we need to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. Could you could you comment on that, John, as we kind of like the, the wilderness is a time where we don't see, we don't feel like anything's happening. But I think there's a lot going on. Job made the comment, look, I go forward, but he's not there and backward and I can't perceive him. But when he works on my left hand, I can't behold him. What Job is saying is God was working on his behalf, but he couldn't see it. And that's what we feel. We feel like God is just like all of a sudden stopped working on our behalf. But in reality, he really is. He just doesn't let us sense that. And that's part of that character growth and that great character maturing. And so if you look at the sons of Issachar in First Chronicles 12, uh, 15, I believe it is, they understood the seasons. They understood the times. So they knew what Israel should do. So there's a time and a season for everything under heaven. That means every season, it says in Ecclesiastes 3, 1, has a purpose. So there is a definite purpose for the wilderness. But let me just say this. If you come to my state, Colorado, and you say, gosh, I want to go, I want to go snowboarding. I want to try it. So you put on all the gear, you've got your snowboard, you get on the chairlift, you go up to the top of the mountain, and then you jump off the chairlift and you fall flat on your face. Why? Because it's summertime. The season is summer. There's no snow on the ground. So what would have been beneficial in January and winter was now detrimental in the summer. And so it's a lot easier to walk down the hill than to roll down the hill with your snowboard. Okay. So if we don't cooperate, Jesus actually said, you can behold the face of the sky, the season of the weather, what's going to happen, but you can't tell what's going on in this spiritual season. So, if we cooperate with the season, it makes it much more effective and productive. If we fight against the season, what could have been more perfected, per, per, or perfected ends up being a, more of a struggle than what it was intended. So you, you said it perfect, Larry. I believe the Holy Spirit has given us a language. And I, I, give, I tell people all the time, my name's on that book because I was the first guy to get to read it. I believe the Holy Spirit is giving us all language so that we know how to handle this season that we're in. I will say this, Larry, probably 80 to 90% of what I preach have come in the hardest times of my life. Yeah. And just know one thing that God is giving you preaching material, <laughs> wisdom that you can share with your grandchildren, wisdom you can show, share with young people coming into the healthcare industry, into the education and that's why you're going through this struggle. God didn't author it. He's not the author of evil. He can't be tempted with evil. But God knows what people are going to do. And God says, I'll use this. And so I wanted you to make sure that you understand. It wasn't God who tempted Jesus in the wilderness. It was the devil. And the way I explained it to one pastor this morning is I said, you know, there were bullies on my son's playground. And I knew that he was going to face those bullies. What I gave him was the wisdom to face them, and he handled them very well. God didn't, I didn't create those bullies. The teachers didn't create them. They were there. I didn't pull my son from school. I sent him, but I gave him what he needed. And that's why James says, count it all joy when you're going through these times. And then he quickly says, if you lack wisdom, give it to God because he wants to give it to you. And so we, when we go through these hard seasons, this is when God downloads wisdom that will help many others. Paul said, the suffering that I'm going through here in Asia is going to help many, many others. And so you have to look at this. It's not a waste of time. God's doing things on many fronts. He's building your character. He's strengthening you. He's giving you wisdom to share with others that one day when you come out of, you'll be able to articulate to them what they're going through. There is so many things happening that God is doing in our life in the wilderness season. And so please don't ever think God did this to me. 
that wilderness is not about God punishing you. It's not about him putting sickness on you. It's not about him putting disease on you. It's not about him uh, causing poverty to come in you. That is not from God. And God is never going to be tempted with evil. He's never going to do that with his children. But he knows we live in a fallen world. And he says, I'm going to use this fallen world and what it throws in order to strengthen and teach you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, that's why I do encourage you to pick up the book. I mean, again, it is language because sometimes I think what happens, John, is people are going through this kind of stuff. And yeah. you are exactly right. I feel like we can't say that loud enough that the, that the Lord is not the author of these things. Because what the devil loves to do, what the enemy loves to do in the middle of a wilderness time where God is actually doing a lot. I'm just going to say this. We'll finish up with this new wine bit. But God is doing a lot. For those of you who feel like, man, that, that's me. I need to get this book. Well, get the book. But be encouraged right now. God is moving. God is moving and doing a lot of things behind the scenes. In fact, God, the Redeemer and the Restorer is saying to you right now, not one moment will be wasted. I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying not one moment of the wilderness will be wasted but do not be very careful, be very vigilant to be discerning because the enemy would love to come and let you know, you know what, you're, I mean, he would love to lie to you about the nature of the wilderness. Particularly, John, I think one of the devil's favorite lies is nothing's going on. You're, you've been put on the shelf. God has done with you or you, you've obviously done something to make God mad at you and all that kind of stuff. Now, I love what you talk about in this book, and I think this is worth repeating. You know, sometimes we sin and it produces certain results in our lives, but God is such a faithful father that when we repent, then he's, he is quick. He's given us a gift called repentance. When yeah. we repent, then we are restored into that wonderful fellowship with him. And uh, I, I just want to encourage you right now, for those of you who's like, did I do something? Listen, if you've repented and you've gone through those processes and you still feel like I'm in a wilderness, the Lord's saying right now, I want to show you how to leverage the wilderness. I want to show you how to actually pull everything out of the wilderness. Because, John, time after time, you have it in the book, but in the scriptures, what does God say that he wants to do in wildernesses? I'll, I'll let you answer that one, but it's always very encouraging. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I want to say this. So, sometimes a person will bring themselves into a desert place because yeah. of lack of wisdom, because of even sin. But like you said, the repentance there's forgiveness, and God will use that time to teach them. But I just want you to know, if you're in a desert place, probably if you're a person that's really going after God and there's no sin that you know of, don't look for sin that's not there. Please. Um, you know, there's consequences. I mean, let me just be blunt. If a girl gets pregnant, she's got consequences to work through. But God will use those. But here's the thing you have to remember. You could be living very, very obedient to God. Jesus was living perfect, but the Holy Spirit led him into the desert to be tested of the devil. Joseph wasn't really sinning. He wasn't being really wise, but God used his brother's evil behavior to work in him. And so I want to encourage you, just because you're in a desert, don't look for sin or disobedience or lack of wisdom. Because I know the very first wilderness that I went through was an 18-monther. And I didn't do one thing to bring it on. It was all circumstantial. But it really wasn't circumstantial. God knew it would happen and said, I'm going to use it. Yeah. What I love about the book as well, John, and then we'll finish up here. But I, sorry, I could, I could keep going on and on about it because I really <laughs> I mean, you you wrote this, you released this at a very timely season because I do feel like that there is an influx of people who feel like I'm going through this. I don't know what's happening. And the reality is you talk about at least two major wilderness seasons that you went through. Yes. And here's the deal. You didn't have this book at the time. Oh, my you, God. You're, you, you so are crying out, God, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And I don't want people doing that, Larry. Because, and, and I made this point, you know, I've been through several seasons of the desert, okay? Every single promotion in my life, I have seen a major wilderness beforehand. It's amazing. But the first two, because the first one was really tough, because God's presence was so strong as a baby Christian. But the first 18 months I went through, I had so many questions. And then the second one made the first one look like a picnic. And the second one, I had more questions. But... 
God began to show me so much in those first two that when I came into the other ones, I knew what was going on. And so most of my drawing as far as experientially comes out of those first two because I had so many questions. And Larry, I just love it when the Holy Spirit can answer people's questions before them having to go through the frustration of crying out, crying out, crying out, crying out and saying, what's going on? What's going on? And I believe that's the purpose for this book. It's just to help people understand. Understanding is so important. What they're in isn't, isn't punishment, isn't being put off, isn't being put on a shelf and how to respond correctly. Yeah. And just as a side note there, I mean, if we actually believe that the wilderness is the result of us being punished, put on a shelf. So, I mean, we need to resist that thinking because what will happen is God wants you. I, I, I feel inclined to say this. God is actually looking for your participation in a wilderness season because he is doing something and he's looking for your agreement. He's looking for your partnership. He is moving. He wants you to move with him. But here's the problem. If we believe that God is doing this to us in a negative way, we will resist the Holy Spirit. We will resist the very one who's calling us into partnership to actually bring the wilderness to a close. Uh, we will resist that if we believe God is doing this to us, because why would we want to partner with a God who's making all these bad things happen to us? So it's so important. John made it so clear, and I'm so grateful for that in his heart and his book, is that this is not God causing all these things bad happen to you. God is doing something behind the scenes, and he is really setting you up. I believe he's setting you up, and he's setting the church up for breakthrough. John, I'm going to read this last bit, and I'd love you to comment, and then we'll pray into this. Um, There's a chapter called New Wine. And this just, as a revivalist, as somebody who's so interested in what God's doing in the earth right now, it stirred me. And I want to read this. John says this. Do you remember how wonderful it was when you were first filled with the Holy Spirit? God's presence was sweet and strong. Every time you'd pray, his presence immediately would manifest itself and you would sense his nearness all day long. At times in church, you would just sit and cry because he was so close. I just... I can relate to that. I feel like there's people who are watching either now or later. You feel like, yeah, that, that's me, Larry, but I'm not there anymore. Hold on. He continues. Then one, one day, much later, you notice that you didn't sense his presence quite so easily. You were still praying like you used to, but now you begin to wonder, God, where are you? You've arrived at a wilderness. Stop right there. So many people are like, God, what did I do? Why aren't, where, why aren't we, God, where we used to be? Why, why don't I feel as close to you as I used to? Why don't I hear your voice? Why don't I sense your presence? Well, John wrote this. There is a reason for that wilderness or fast of God's presence. And I want to prophesy this over you. And then, John, I'm going to let you finish up. But this is out of John's words, really. There's a reason for that wilderness. God is preparing you to be a new wineskin. You can't put new wine, which is a fresh move of God's spirit, into old wineskins. I just want to just share, John, as you're led by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for people because that's powerful. (laughs) You know, I just want to say this. God does. He he has fresh moves of his spirit. Wine and scripture are always a representation of his tangible presence. When they had when they renewed the wineskins, they were made out of. Sheep's intestines, goat's intestines, sheep skin, they were flexible and pliable, but after fermenting and sitting for a long time, they would become hard and rigid. They would pour the wine out, and then they would rub it with olive oil and soak, soak it in water first and rub it with olive oil. What happens is, the thing that God really made clear to me is that the wine has to be poured out. Once the wine's poured out, we feel empty. Where's his tangible presence? But that's the time when we pray a lot, and we spend a lot of time in the word, the washing of the water of the word. That's the time when we rub olive oil. We're praying a lot. And that makes us flexible and pliable again so that when the new wine comes, we don't reject it and go, oh, I like the old better. We're now prepared. We're flexible and pliable, ready to move in the new way that the Holy Spirit's going to move. So we always want to be vessels that are flexible and pliable. And God knows just how to do it. He knows how to get us to seek him more to search for him more. I'm not saying that he he never, ever forsakes us, but is manifest. There's two presences that God talks about, his omnipresence, his manifest presence. He's in us and he's with us. That will never stop, okay? I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus says. However, as far as sensing it, 
you don't sense it. And wine is always a type of the manifest presence, not the omnipresence of God. So the reason you may not sense it is probably because he's causing you to seek more, to read more, spend time with him more in the scripture, so that you're going to become a little bit more tender and flexible and pliable. So when he pours in that fresh move of the spirit, you're a ready vessel. Because here's the thing, he doesn't want to break the vessel. If you put new wine into unrenewed wineskins, old wineskins, it will break them. And the, think of it, the wineskin is you. It's yeah. the church. It's the con- wh- whoever's containing the fresh move of the spirit. God loves you. He doesn't want to break you, destroy you. The wine's lost. The vessel is ruined. He doesn't want that for you. So it's you cooperating, saying, hey, I want to go to the next move of the spirit. If you say, I want to know, I want to stay in the old. God will say, okay, I love you so much. I don't want you destroyed. I don't want the wine skin destroyed. Stay with the old, but you're not going to experience the fresh thing of what I'm doing in the earth. When you have that perspective, then you understand why it's important what you're going through. Yeah, that's so true. And I encourage you guys is that for those of you particularly who have enjoyed past moves of God, and I have, I'm I'm grateful for everything he's done in the past, but particularly in your own life where you had a season, maybe you can trace it back to a revival service or an altar call or these moments or seasons where you felt God so powerfully in your life. And it's like, okay, I haven't sinned. I have, I, I'm doing my best with what God's told me to do, I, but it just doesn't feel like it used to. And, you know, John, we, we do services and conferences, all of us. And time after time, we, we pray for people like that. But here's what Holy Spirit spoke to me one time as I was praying about this situation, praying for somebody. He said this, is that in that particular person, I believe this is relevant and this is completely in agreement with what you were talking about in this chapter, is that for those of you who feel dry and you feel like it, it's not right now like it used to be five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe a couple months ago, the Lord's saying, good, because I'm actually setting you some, I'm setting you up for something even greater. Because isn't that yeah. his movement? Glory yes. to glory. And yes. you know, we, we can what happens is we memorialize the past. We memorialize yes. something that God did in the past, which is great. We need to remember the works of the Lord, not to memorialize them inappropriately, but to see dryness and wilderness. Lord, I yes. recognize behind the scenes you're preparing me for a fresh yes. move of the spirit. John, would you just pray for our friends and um, oh, wow. I, I encourage you guys. If the book is God, where are you? It's available wherever books are sold. And again, I believe this is going to give the body of Christ language for navigating wilderness seasons. So thank you, John. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Larry and Destiny Image. I pray that you continue to bless them and continue to use them to send out messages to the body of Christ that we need. And Father, I pray for everyone that's on this this, uh, uh, live Facebook Live. I pray for them. If they are in a desert season, Holy Spirit, give them wisdom. Holy Spirit, strengthen them. Holy Spirit, work the character of Jesus in them. And Lord, I'm asking that you would show them the pathway you've chosen for them, that they would be obedient, that they would have the strength to obey you, even when it looks like it's not profitable for them. We know, Lord, anytime we obey you, it ultimately ends up for our good. But Lord, I ask that you give them the strength to to be able to see as Jesus. He endured the cross because he saw the joy that was set before him. I just command in the name of Jesus now, every lie of the enemy that has been spoken to my friends, my brothers and sisters that are on this Facebook Live, I break the power of that lie. I break the power of that deception. And I command it to be lifted and gone from you in the name of Jesus. And I'm praying for understanding. May the spirit of the fear of the Lord come upon every person. And may they have understanding of the time that they're in so that they will know what to do, even as the sons of Issachar. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, especially, I ask that you bless Larry. I love this brother so much, and I am so grateful for his heart. He's a great leader in the body of Christ, but yet he keeps such an open, tender, teachable heart. I pray that you bless him greatly for the way he loves your church, the way he loves the kingdom. Father, thank you for Larry Sparks. Bless him in ways that he can't even imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I love you, man. And again, 
for all of you guys. It's God, where are you? Again, language for your wilderness that I believe will help you navigate through it in victory. So blessings to you all. Look forward to talking to you again very soon. All right, thanks so much. I love you.